I suppose every preacher wrestles with himself on what his introduction is going to be, what his conclusion is going to be, and in fact, he wrestles over the whole sermon. Uh, but I always think about it when I come here, especially uh, the many faces that are familiar, uh, the many friends that uh, Miss Moan and I have developed over the years at this congregation, uh, the, well, and at other congregations, uh, uh, not only around Texas, but Oklahoma as well. And so uh, I always think about what I'm going to say to the congregation here, and I love this congregation so much, I really do, and uh, I think about y'all and I pray for y'all quite often. And uh, one of the things that uh, I told Dink this earlier, but I said one of the things that I want to start with is I want to start with a rebuke. Okay, maybe just a mild rebuke, an admonition. And I want to say it maybe as kind as I possibly can, but I want to say it at the very beginning. Don't you dare for selfish purposes, interrupt, slow down, or take away from the beautiful harmony and the beautiful work that this congregation has been invested in. I can remember at San Angelo when Brother Mike got there that uh, uh, one of the things I said to him and I said to the other preachers that got there was the only way this works, Brian as well, that the only way this works is if our egos don't get in the way. And the same is true in every congregation, no matter where it is. By the way, I hadn't spotted anything. I just wanted to say that. I, I, listen, you don't know what the devil's about to do to you. You don't know. Listen, Tom said, Brother Waycaster said, if we could just pull back that curtain to be able to see about the powers that are working behind the scenes, the Bible tries to give us a picture of what the devil is seeking to do to us. And the problem is that oftentimes when the devil shows us who he is, we don't believe him. All I'm asking you to do is to believe him. He does not have our best interest at heart. So continue, continue to be the people that you have been that have built this good work. Now, I do want to say that uh, uh, I would be here. I'd move here in a heartbeat. But I ain't leaving Nazareth. I love those brethren back in Nazareth. Got three fine elders, a wonderful congregation. I love that. But I really want to take the opportunity to invite you to be with us at the end of January. We have a fine lectureship there. It's not, it is crowded, but it ain't this crowded. But uh, we have a wonderful lectureship, and I want to invite you to that. But I have spent too much time on uh, that part of it. But I did, I did remember a preacher telling me one time that sometimes a preacher just needs to talk to a congregation. So we're going to quit the talking and start preaching. So there in Revelation chapter 1, as was read earlier, I'm going to ask you to back up all the way to chapter 1 and verse number 1 in your Bible. We're going to spend a lot of time uh, looking at passages, reading passages. Uh, I wish I had the memory of some of these guys, but I do not. And so we're going to read a lot. Ain't nothing wrong with reading or quoting, but we're going to read a lot. So Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1, if you would, open up your Bible there, and you'll note the very theme of this particular book. He tells us right off uh, in the beginning, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is about. It is about a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a revelation from Jesus Christ, and it is a revelation about Jesus Christ. And you'll find it, the, the, the main thought of this entire uh, uh, letter is about the Lamb. The Lamb is the most utilized name for Jesus in the book of Revelation. It is about His sacrifice. It is about what we do with that sacrifice. It is about what God can do for us, with us, because of that sacrifice. We can be overcomers. Anything Satan has that he wants to bring our way, we can overcome through 
the lamb. We can be the bride of that lamb. And so this is all about the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that he begins almost immediately, if you look down with me just for time's sake at verse number 5, he begins to talk about this revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood the sacrifice of the Lamb. But I want you to notice, dropping down to verse number 8, that uh, this is our uh, particular theme, that He is the Alpha and the Omega. I would ask that if you write in your Bibles that you write the word the in there. It is in the original text, and it's not I am Alpha and Omega. That makes sense in English, but there is something being stressed here that He is the Alpha and the Omega. And he is the only one in regards to this. Now, he is the beginning and the end. Uh, but I want you to notice then verse number nine. The very first two words, I, John. Here is the Alpha and the Omega that is being presented for us. But then you have uh, a, a, a look back at John now, the one who has been given this revelation, and he is writing and he says i am your brother your companion in tribulation in the kingdom in the patience of jesus christ but i want you to notice here he says verse number 10 now i john i was in the spirit on the lord's day and i heard john hears something and he tells us that he heard something from behind him and it was a voice but it was more than just a voice. It was a loud voice. It was almost like either Jaggy or Rick was walking up behind you. It was a loud voice, right, behind you. He says it was a great voice, and he describes it as the voice of a trumpet. Now, just imagine that you're kind of relaxed. You're walking, and all of a sudden, somebody comes up behind you with a trumpet and blares that trumpet. That probably startled you just a little bit, wouldn't it? John says, I am in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and all of a sudden there is this great voice that is behind me. What interests me is the Bible doesn't say John turned around immediately. If I hear a great voice behind me, I'm turning around immediately, but that's not what John does. The voice is talking to John, verse 11, saying... Here's this loud voice. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, John, he says, I want you to write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. Now, he lists those seven churches as were read in our hearing earlier. And then I want you to notice what happened. And I turned. I turned to see the voice that spake unto me. And being turned, I saw the very first thing that he saw was seven golden candlesticks. Now, he's going to describe all that. I don't have time to get into the explanation of all of the details here. But I want you to picture, you hear this trumpet voice behind you. You, you converse with, now you turn around to see, and you see seven golden candlesticks. And someone is now, that voice that spoke to you, now is described here as standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks and is one like unto the Son of Man. That's the Alpha. That's the Omega. But I will tell you, I had the same problem Brother Richard did on this. I'm thinking, why in the world would they divide up that which Scripture does not divide up? It took me a long... And then I began to study this begin to look at it, begin to meditate and chew on this a little bit. And then I said, you know what? I like this. I like the fact that they have chosen a fat boy to deal with the fatty acids. Okay, it didn't work that well. But uh, that's, uh, I, that, listen, uh, he, uh, the, the last, this is the, this is the uh, caboose in the train that's coming around. I am the omega is what we're going to do. And it took me a long time to wrap my mind. 
in what sense is Jesus just, that's my theme, just the omega? In what sense could I be dealing with the fact that he is the omega? And then if you look in this section and you look at sections that are similar to this, you find how Jesus is that omega. And so with that in mind, I want you now to turn uh, to the book of Hebrews. You might keep your marker there, but Hebrews chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I want you to note the fact that uh, not only is Jesus proclaimed to be the omega here, but I want you to notice that uh, he is demonstrated to be the omega on many different levels in Scripture. One, uh, just three ways, maybe four tonight, uh, this afternoon, that we're going to deal with. And uh, we won't deal extensively with each one of them. But might I just put them before your thought or your mind so that you can study those a little bit later. Number one, Jesus is the Omega in regards to Revelation. Number two, Jesus is the Omega in regards to redemption. I ain't like Brother... I ain't like... Brother Jenny. Listen, we got on the same suit, but he feels it out just a little bit different than I do. Okay? The last one is, uh, at least the third one is, Jesus is the Omega in regards to mediation. And then I suppose finally, in conclusion, we're going to say that Jesus is the Omega with regards to judgment. Now you think about each one of them in regards to what the book of Revelation and the book of Hebrews uh, outlines for us. So you have Hebrews chapter 1 beginning in verse number 1, right? God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days. Now that's not the word omega, that's just a little insignia, but it is the last day concept, right? In these last days. This is the last revelation humanity is going to get from God. This is it. There ain't no other revelation. And when Jude puts down his pen of inspiration by saying that this is the final revelation of God, that's it. There ain't no more. He says we're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all time delivered, past tense. Delivered unto the saints. There ain't any other. It does not matter whether or not there are people out there on the commercial that want to talk to you about another testament. It ain't another testament. It does not matter if there are individuals in the world that swear by the Koran. There ain't another testament after this one. There is not another revelation of Jesus Christ. It does not matter if the Baptist pastor says to you that he got a revelation from God last night. He did not because Jesus is the last revelation from God. This is it. He is the Omega in regards to revelation. And so notice here, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed uh, uh, heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now there's a couple other things that I want us to notice in regards to this because this is a very important concept that Paul in Hebrews and John in Revelation is building to. You remember in the Old Testament there was an anticipation for what was referred to as the anointed one, Psalm 2. Uh, God is sending his anointed, the Messiah, right? We call it in the New Testament, the Christ. There is an anticipation that is building up for every Jewish family that our Savior is coming. And, and they knew the timing. They knew the place. They, knew, they, they were very particular in their understanding of Old Testament Scripture in regards to these things. But that Christ, that anointed individual, is important in these contexts, and I would say in relationship to the Omega. Because under the Old Testament, you had three functions or three offices that are going to be combined together in regards to the Christ. The office of the Christ is made up of the office of a prophet. It is made up of the office of a priest, and it is made up of the office of a king. 
When you put all those together, those were not together under the Old Testament, but in the Christ, they are placed together. I want you to notice Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, here's the simple sentence, by the way. It's just three words. God, who at sundry times in divers manner, spake in time past unto the fathers uh, by the prophets, hath of these last days spoken unto us by the Son. Just remember three words. God hath spoken. And he spoke by Christ. That's the simple sentence. God spoke through Christ. That's the work of a prophet. Jeremiah was told in Jeremiah chapter uh, 23, do not diminish, do not diminish, not one odd, not one word. Don't diminish from my word. Speak exactly what I was told. Uh, uh, Jonah was told the same thing, right? Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. And then in chapter 3, you tell them the preaching, or you preach the preaching that I bid thee. Don't preach anything else. You preach what I preach. That's what a prophet did. Jesus is called in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, the faithful witness. That's the prophet. You see, from Revelation to Hebrews, we're building up, Paul and John are building up this argument that Jesus is the Christ because he fulfills all of the requirements of the anointed one, prophet, priest, and king. But now notice chapter 1 and verse number 3 here in the book of Hebrews. Well, somebody knew what I was going to need, didn't they? Ah, I just pray. That's Bible word, Bible concept. I'm okay. I can do ah. It just feels good. All right. So you're there, right? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Now notice this. When he had by himself purged our sin. What's the work of a high priest? Well, I don't need to ask you. Let's just go over to Hebrews chapter 5. Right? Hebrews chapter 5. Notice with me. We're going to begin verse number 1. Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. What are those things? That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. What was the work of a, prophet, a priest? It was to offer a sacrifice for sin. There is no greater sacrifice that could be offered. The blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews 10, cannot take away sin. So what can? The only thing that can take away sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. And, and Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7. But notice here, you have Jesus now fulfilling the role or the office of a high priest. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute when we look at uh, uh, this section. But notice with me back in chapter 1 and verse number 3. Notice he goes on to say, not only what did he purge by himself, purge our sins, but he sat down, notice this, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We will be told that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords in the book of Revelation. You see, he is fulfilling prophet priest, and king. In three short verses, the book of Hebrews opens up with a proclamation that no Jew could ignore. He either is that anointed one or he is not. And the rest of the letter is nothing but absolute proof that Jesus is what the writer of the book of Hebrews is proclaiming in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He takes it as it is. He takes every piece of Judaism, every piece of that Old Testament legal system, that law, and he dismantles it and shows how Jesus is better than. He's better than the prophets of the Old Testament. He's better than the angels that brought the message of God in the Old Testament. He's better than, oh, by the way, let's just stop there. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the angels. So he is the best prophet God had at his disposal. By the way, if you have the best, you don't need anything after you. And so Jesus is proclaimed. But now wait a minute. He is a better redeemer 
than Moses. He is a better redeemer than Joshua. Moses took them out of the land of Egypt, and Joshua brought them into the land of Canaan. But there's a problem here. Look, look with me at Hebrews chapter 3 just for a second here, and notice the argumentation that is made here. He's talking about the consideration of Jesus, who is our uh, apostle and high priest of our profession, but he uses Moses as the example in this chapter. And he says, notice very clearly that he says in verse number 5, and Moses verily was faithful in. That's a big word in this context. In. You're going to see in the next verse that Jesus is over. There's a big difference between in and over. And notice this, that Moses was in his house as a servant. Jesus was over the house as a son. In other words, it, listen, it doesn't take, listen, even a person from Oklahoma can understand this. In or over is better than in, and a son is better than a servant. That's the argumentation that he's making here. And then Joshua, you remember, Joshua did not give them the full rest that God was wanting to give his children. Joshua gave them rest in a physical land. God is wanting to give us a rest in a spiritual land. So there is an anticipation that as we are traveling, uh, proverbially in this 40 years of wandering, and uh, that at the end of our wandering, there is Canaan's land that is waiting for us, that spiritual land that we call heaven, or that God calls heaven, right? And so he is better than uh, Moses, because Moses took them out of Egypt, God or Jesus takes us out of sin. He takes us out of the bondage of sin and the bondage of Satan. And he takes us in to the very presence of God for an eternity. So he's better than in regard uh, to that. And then mediation. Mediation is where this function of a high priest comes in. And Jesus is better than Levi. He is better than the Levitical, his priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood that you read about in the book of Hebrews uh, is better than the Levitical priesthood. In fact, he uses an argument uh, that uh, Brother Brandt mentioned earlier about primogenitor rights in regards to the greater and the lesser and in regards to uh, Levi being in the loins of Abraham. He uses those argumentation to demonstrate uh, the, the fact that Jesus' uh, ministry of a high priest is better than the Aaronic priesthood. It's better than the Levitical priesthood. And not only that, the sacrifice that he brings to the table is so much better than the sacrifice of bulls and goats. That's the book of Hebrews. And then he begins to encourage us uh, throughout the rest of the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and following. But he's laid down the groundwork that there is a prophet, there is a priest, and there is a king, and that Jesus and his office of Christ, I think sometimes we miss this uh, point. Uh, sometimes we think that Christ is the last name of Jesus. You know, it's like Rick Popejoy, B.J. Clark, Oh, Jesus Christ. No, no, no. See, Jesus is the name. Christ is an office. Lord is actually a title. And so you have Lord Jesus Christ. You have his title. You have his name. And you have his office. So we're talking about some function in regards to the work of Jesus Christ. A prophet reveals the Father and his will to humanity. A priest makes an appeal to the Father on our behalf, and a king directs our path so that we can get to the Father. That's what Christ did for us and continues to do for us. So, you know, much like, uh, uh, much like Peter, should we not say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. 
Uh, there is no other place to go. Come see a man that told me all things. He must be the Christ, right? You'll find those, those kind of statements in the book of John over and over and over again. Turn with me just for a half a second. Hold your finger there in Hebrews, uh, but turn me to John chapter 12. You remember in John chapter 12 that there were some uh, Greeks that came and they were seeking after Jesus. And they made the statement, uh, they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. We wanna, we've heard about Jesus. We want to see him. We want to talk with him. We want to converse with him. We want to know about who Jesus is. Jesus is the omega of revelation. That's our first point that we want to establish. And you see that throughout the book of, uh, uh, the book of uh, uh, Hebrews here. So, uh, let's just dig a little deeper here in chapter 1. Notice this. Uh, verse number 4, it says, uh, he, him, he says, being so much better than the angels, as he hath an inheritance obtained, a more excellent name than they. And so then he begins to offer argumentation as to why Jesus is better than the angels. So why is Jesus better than the angels? Well, number one, his relationship to the Father is better. Notice chapter 1 and verse number 5. For which under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. Now, we've talked about this for uh, this entire week in the Men's Development Conference on what that means in the Gospel of John. I got one. I just ain't pulled it out yet. I figure I wasn't far enough in yet to pull it out. So, But uh, notice what he says here. Uh, notice what he says in verse number 6. Uh, the angels, by the way, Revelation chapter 22, uh, angels refuse worship when it's offered to them. Jesus did not implying that he is greater than the angels. So verse number 6, again, uh, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world and saith, and let all the angels of God, what are they doing? Worshiping him. You see, that's what the angels are doing. Notice his, his moral superiority, the very fact his kingship in verse number 8, but unto the Son. Now, he didn't say it of the angels, but unto the Son saith he, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. Notice the quality of his reign is the scepter of thy kingdom. Notice with me in verse number 11 and 12. He is eternal. Uh, they shall perish, but thou remainest, as they all shall wax as old uh, doth a, a, as a garment. And the vesture, he says, uh, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall never fail. Is that not the conclusion that the Hebrew writer comes to in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He changeth not. Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2 says, He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. None of the angels are eternal in regards to that. He is greater than, better than the angels. Notice verse number 13 and the victory that he offers. Now, you remember on one occasion that one angel was able to wipe out an entire army of 185,000. That's pretty powerful. But you know what's powerful than having the ability to wipe out an army of 185,000? creating the universe, <laughs> offering victory over Satan. This is going to be highlighted in chapter 2, but notice verse number 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies, what? Footstool. You know what being the footstool of somebody is, right? Servant of, and a lowly servant of that. So he's going to say in chapter 2 and verse number 14, he's going to say, for as much then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that, that uh, through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. And just in case you don't get it, he says that is the devil who brought victory. Isn't it great that we can sing victory in Jesus? What a powerful song. What a beautiful song. We have that because of who Jesus is. 
because of the office that he was willing to take on our behalf and the sacrifice that he made in order to engage in that particular office. And so I, I wish we had time to deal with the fact that he is both human and divine at the same time, but we simply do not. So I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 4, because I want to deal with the aspect of mediation at this particular time. And in Hebrews chapter 4, there is a, a powerful argument there that Jesus makes, beginning in verse number 14, concerning that mediation. He says, seeing then, this is the argument based upon He's greater than Moses as a redeemer. He's greater than Joshua as a redeemer. And uh, then uh, he says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, he says, Let us hold fast our profession. Jesus is our great high priest. He purged us of our sins, chapter 1 and verse number 3, right? He is the exalted one. He is passed into the heavens, chapter 4, and verse number 14, notice, he says there, uh, he has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Again, a statement of victory over death in regards. He is the perfect mediator. He is called Jesus, the Son of God. He is the object of our confession. Notice what he says here in regard to hold fast our profession. But he is also, notice verse, verse number 15, he is our sympathetic high priest as well he is our great high priest but he is not so great that he cannot stoop down to sympathize with us because he came in the flesh and, and that, listen you need to study if you it, there's a lot of studies we need to have there's no doubt but i think sometimes we pass over the incarnation of jesus christ Luke chapter 1, and, and, and the power of deity, the Father, the highest, being overshadowed of the Holy Spirit, and then the incarnation of the Son, the power of that. That's one of the things that allows Him to be able to sympathize with us in regards to that. So, for we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, uh, He says, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. He was tempted just like you and I was, were, are tempted. But he did so without sin. Notice that he can sympathize with us because of that. He can, as he says here, can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Now sometimes, listen, we, we kind of go over statements sometimes we all do it but have you ever have you ever watched those commercials about those children in africa india right if you if you don't change the channel you just kind of go do something you avert your eyes you know sometimes we can walk right by people that are struggling and we don't see the struggle at all there, there are times in the Lord's church that individuals, they're sitting beside you. They're having struggles in their life. And you come in here and you sit beside them and you leave and uh, you have no idea sometimes of the struggle that they're facing. Sometimes we can just put on blinders in our life. We go to work, we go to school, and there are individuals that are having those same difficulties, and we just walk right by them. And what it means is that there are times in which we do not want to be touched with the feelings of their infirmities. Jesus ain't like that. Now, it is true that we ought to be like Jesus, right? So there's something for us and a challenge for us to be more like Jesus means that we need to be able to touch, be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Allow it just to sink in. I'm not talking about intellectually. Brother Tom brought a great lesson and, and he showed the dichotomy of the, of the intellect and the emotions and the will. Sometimes our volition is not engaged because we just see it intellectually. Yeah, I know people suffer. Yes, I know that that person is going through some things but I don't 
feel it. It doesn't affect me emotionally. Sometimes we do religion like that. We can sing about the activity upon the cross of Christ without shedding a tear. Sometimes we get so engaged in just the activity that we forget that the intellect is designed to touch my emotions. You understand that the power of the intellect and the ability of the emotions is what allows the engine of volition to kick in. We have to be able to think deeper about these things. We have to be able to... I'll just stop there. Verse 16. He is our merciful and gracious high priest. We can come to God with confidence because of that. Notice he talks about coming boldly and uh, in time of, here it is again, in time of need. You know, listen, we ask people, we ask one another all the time, how you doing? I'm doing great. No need. Uh, that's fine. I'm okay with that kind of conversation. Then somebody begins to unfold for us the needs they're having. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I wasn't asking because I wanted to know how you were doing. That's just a general greeting, right? Uh, and, and then you leave from there sometimes. And some, listen, what I'm saying is there are times in which if we are not careful, we can become callous toward our own brethren, toward the, toward the people that are upon this globe with us. There are people that are lost in sin. I have that knowledge up here. How does it affect my emotional makeup? What does it do for that engine of volition in regards to that? Does it motivate me to do something different? Does it motivate me to engage in people's lives? To talk to them. To be willing to be touched by the feelings of their infirmity. Jesus is a great, merciful high priest because he was willing to be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Because he chose to be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Jesus is the final answer that God has for man. Both in revelation, in, 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 me, in redemption, and in mediation and in the judgment. There is coming a day, my friend, in the which you and I will stand before this great and merciful high priest. And if we have not been faithful to him, there is no excuse. You just don't understand. No, no, I think he does. Uh, you, 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 can't, you can't understand what we're... No, I think he does. That's the whole point of the book of... That's the whole point of the entire Bible is to show that God cares and he cares enough to be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, to be touched with what it's like to struggle with the power of sin in our lives. There are individuals, members of the body of Christ that right now are struggling with Im with more moral sins in their lives. It, the, the wickedness is overpowering our society. You can't turn anywhere. And I listen, we're not talk, we're not going to start with pornography that is way out there, the depths of wickedness. You can begin with just the immodest apparel that you see everywhere. You can't go to a restaurant where you don't have to close your eyes or change your eyes somewhere. You can't go to a ball game without seeing that kind of junk. And it's all over the place. You can't watch a commercial without seeing that kind of junk. And nowadays you can't see a commercial hardly without uh, even a dog food commercial where you're seeing two men kiss one another. 
You, you, you just can't, you can't hardly shed your, keep your eyes away from that kind of stuff. It's all around us. It's, it's enveloping us. You know, I had a young man just a few minutes ago ask me, I, he said he was asking other preachers about what I thought was one of the greatest problems that we are faced with and what would be the solution. I think Amos had it correct in his day and as well as in ours. Amos lived during a time of great wealth in his society. And he said, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. Now, ease does not mean they're just taking it easy. They're taking a nap or they're uh, sitting down. It means complacent. It has to do with the empathy that we can have toward individuals that have struggled or are struggling with the infirmities of life. Whether it be a moral issue, how are we getting young men and young women away from the immoral society? How are we strengthening them, you see? That's the answer. We're going to have to do something in regards to strengthen. Oh, wait a minute, we are. That's where the Young Men Development Conference came in. And then, don't take offense at this, but uh, I, listen, I, I was raised in Oklahoma. Y'all know that I, language is not my best part. Uh, uh, I barely passed English when I, I was in eighth grade, so I didn't get much further than that. But uh, when we had the Young Men's Development Conference, the old men began to complain. Complain is probably a harsh word. They didn't really complain. They said, we want some of that stuff. Uh, and then we started, then, then it was the Men's Development Conference, right? And, and then some of the ladies began, oh, complain, I know it's a little hard. Y'all don't complain. You begin to say, we want some of that too. And so he said, well, okay, if we can train young men, then we can train old men, right? I, I mean, old men are a little harder to train, but you can train them, right? Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, somebody trained, uh, well, no, I won't go there. Okay, but uh, uh, listen, uh, not only, but if we can train young men and old men, maybe women can be trained too. I know that may be stretching a little bit, but I, I listen, uh, uh, Josh, uh, 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 sorry, uh, but uh, I, listen, w by the way, uh, if this thing grows, we'll continue to train anybody that comes, will we not? I mean, that's what it's all about. We're training people to be a part of the army of Christ so that they can uh, be against the wickedness of Satan that is out there. But that's what the assembly is designed for. The assembly is designed so that we, oh, wait a minute, the book of Hebrews does talk about that, does it not? Now, I'm told by some of my brethren, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 does not, but I still believe what the writer said. So notice here, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider one another. Consider one another. There would be a sense of empathy, would there not, in regards to that? Let us consider one another. What does he say? Um, um, uh, to provoke one another. To love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The assembly is designed for the provoking. That's a part of its purpose. We're encouraging one another. We're provoking one another unto love and good works by the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, sometimes just by our own presence. And so the Bible is replete with the fact that Jesus is the final answer and that we should not, we must not reject it. So I want you to think about this judgment then that is going to be offered. Second Corinthians chapter 10, Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10 talked about we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to take place at that time? That, I, I know we might say, well, we're all going to stand there. We're all going to give an, an individual account. I'm not asking for that. What's going to take place at that time? There is an accounting that takes place at that time. An accounting. I want you to think about it. Brother J.W. Garvey years ago, maybe a century and some odd ago, said, uh, and he trained preachers uh, way back then, and he said, I would consider above every other gift that could be bestowed upon me as a preacher, the ability to understand what sin is 
and to be able to convey it to the people. Sometimes the greatest work that a preacher can be involved in is ignored in the pulpits across our land. Sin and its consequences must be dealt with from our pulpits. Now God, throughout His entire book, deals with the power of sin in our lives. But I want to close with just this illustration that is used in the book of Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, almost the entire chapter is, de- is dealing with the consequences of sin and uh, God's response to that sin. But I want you to hear what he says beginning in chapter 1 and verse number 2. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished up and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, I don't know if you've ever been the father or a parent of a rebellious child. I, I know all the children here at BCS are angels. Uh, at least I know, I, I know Jason's and BJ's grandchild must be the prettiest child I've ever seen. I've got eight of them, and they aren't even close. So, uh, you know, but, but uh, you know, we're, listen, I, listen, our children can become rebellious. And when they do, it will break your heart. I remember telling my son one time, he had gone astray, was living wickedly. Still suffers from the consequences of that, by the way. Be careful where you go. But I remember telling him, talking to him about his pathway. I said, son, do you remember, do you, I want you to understand that your mother cries herself to sleep every night because of the direction that you are going. It is heartbreaking to deal with a child that is rebellious. And yet Isaiah says that's the way God looks at our sins. When we sin and we begin that rebellious state against God, it's as if His own children are rebelling against Him. But He doesn't stop there. He talks about the, uh, the ox knowing His owner and the donkey His master's crib. Uh, if you've ever dealt with a, a donkey or uh, 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 some kind of critter, you know they can, have, they can be pretty headstrong. And uh, they are pretty strong and headstrong. And so you ain't changing the direction. When they want to go in a particular direction, that ox is going to go where he wants to go. And so dealing with them, if you're a rancher, I know we got a few ranchers in Texas, right? There, if, you, if, if you've dealt with, a, with an ox, you know how hard it is sometimes. There's a reason why they, uh, in the old days, I don't know if they still do, but put a ring on those bulls uh, so that you could at least try to handle one. But notice here, he doesn't stop there. He says, ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy, uh, Holy One of Israel unto anger, they have gone away backwards. But notice, he, he doesn't stop there. He says, the whole, the whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. I don't know if you've ever dealt with anyone that has had any kind of heart disease or brain disease. But it can destroy the entire makeup of that person. That's how God, when you grasp with that. I can remember, I I think I've told you this story before, but I can remember standing beside my dad as he passed as he breathed his last there in Oklahoma City and praying. The the only prayer that I could think of on my lips is my my father passed, not a child of God. I cannot change the plan of God for my father. In fact, I will be honest with you. I try not to think about it, but it's hard not to. 
there was a young man that came up earlier and he said his his birthday was December the 2nd. That's my dad's birthday. That's the first thing I thought of was standing by my father's side and praying that I pray that I had not failed him. I've tried many times. Many times. But you know what? No matter how many times I had tried, no matter how hard I tried, do you think it did not feel hurtful when he passed away knowing his eternal destiny? My father is not in heaven. He's not on that side where Lazarus resides. My father resides where the rich man resides. Or the poor man. That rich man desired just a, just a touch of water on his tongue. That's where my father is. When I think about that, that hurts all the way down to the deep resources of my bowels. And God has the capacity of empathy thousands of times, eternity beyond what I have. And God says when we sin and we continue in a rebellious state, He says it hurts. He doesn't, by the way, He doesn't stop here. Maybe one of the most illustrative verses in the entire Bible about how God views sin is right here in verse number 6. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, no health at all in this body. It is eaten up with disease. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up nor mollified with ointment. Here is an individual that is oozing out all kinds of green, red, yellow. You know that snot that comes from children's noses when they sneeze? And the young ones, I mean, not, not the older ones, but the, they sneeze in that yellow stuff and then they, they, they suck it in and like that. And, they, you know, they, they don't know anybody. They just, I mean, this stuff is oozing out of this individual's body. That was Israel. Don't let it be us. Don't let it be you that when God looks down upon you, he sees a sin-sick soul, so overcome, so overwhelmed by the power of sin that he cannot look upon you. I mean, it's, it's, is it not, by the way, is it not gross, right? It's sick, right? Aren't you glad I brought that up right after lunch? Anybody's stomach starting to growl with, you know, that snot? You just, you know, and you, they're eating it up. Now, now you mothers, you probably, you've seen that. You just wipe it off with your hand and take it to the sink or whatever. You, you, doesn't, it, oh, it, it causes me to shake and whittle all over the place. Can't handle that kind of stuff. I'm, in fact, I might just... Uh, well, there, listen, there ain't nothing worse than, number one, the child doing that and then the father throwing up, right? By the way, that's a Bible illustration. A dog returning to its what? God's trying to tell us how he sees us engaged in a sinful life. That's why, that's why we've got to avoid it. That's why we've got to eradicate it from our lives. That's why we've got to stay on the right path. Because there is a judgment day coming. And God cannot look upon us in his majestic holiness in regards to that sin that has enveloped our lives. So the plea of every preacher during this lectureship, the plea of every preacher in every service that he ever offers, is that if there's anybody anywhere in the, well, my voice may travel a little farther than others, but if there's anyone anywhere, if you open up these doors, we get downtown uh, College Station, I think. But if there's anyone that has been overcome with sin, 
The Bible describes what sin is. Read Romans chapter 1. Read Galatians chapter 5. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Read the Bible's uh, explanation or the outline of what sin actually is. You know what it is. But if it's overtaken, if you put your foot out to dip in it, it's time to get it out. Our plea, our desire, listen, I, I don't keep track. I don't know anybody here really keeps track. I don't keep track of how many people come and respond to my invitation. It's not my invitation to begin with. But I do care about souls. And I know the preachers that are here, they care about your soul. If you're here, and you're not a child of God. We weep for you every night. It's what keeps elders up. It's what keeps gospel preachers up at night. We weep on our pillows oftentimes for the lost souls. The ones that we do come in contact with. The empathy that we have for them. The, the desire that we want them. When are they going to come? They know the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So when are they going to respond? What will it take to get them to understand that they're outside of Christ and that the blood of Christ has no power over them, no power for them? Or the child of God that is invested in sin. The last thing, I know the last thing that I want and the last thing that you want, if you are in sin this afternoon, there is a judgment day that is coming. And it will not be pretty if you are not faithful in Christ. It can't be because our God is holy and He has loved us enough to send His Son to empathize with us in our sins and to judge us for our sins. If you're here this afternoon and you need to respond to the gospel of Christ, Please do not delay. Come as together we stand in song.